morning. Please be seated. <clears throat> Title of my sermon this morning is Joy in the Wilderness, drawn from the book of Isaiah, chapter 35, verse 6. For the waters shall break forth in the wilderness. Alex sat on my couch. His body seemed to melt into the cushions. Rings hung around his eyes. Tension tightened his face. He spoke with heaviness. His classes were over for the semester, but he still had exams. He had studied all evening, coming in from his dorm room to check in with me for the night. He talked about the number of tests he had tomorrow, the next day, and the next. Our conversation turned to school break that he and his fellow students had in the next few days and what he would do when the, after the exams. His face brightened. He spoke about sleep. He spoke about doing nothing. He spoke about rest. Once his tests were finished, he would enjoy a time of recuperation. In the winter of 1952, a storm rolled into New England. Ships floundered, an oil tanker broke in half. As depicted in the recent movie, The Finest Hours, a small Coast Guard vessel and its crews went into the stormy waters to rescue 30 men from the sinking tanker. After gathering the survivors, they turned for home. To get to port, they had to navigate the dangerous Chatham Bar, where it is reported waves reach 70 feet. The compass was broken and their lights were gone, promising the men on board, they would make it home. The captain guided the vessel by instinct over the bar to safety. In 2013, a woman posted a blog that told her story about having major surgery for the first time. She wrote, It would be the first time I had ever ever had real surgery, the kind where you are cut open while unconscious and organs are removed. I'd never been sedated before and didn't know exactly what would happen. But she needed the surgery and she went on to explain her fear of the operation, the anesthesia, and the recovery. She told how she posted her fears on Facebook, and a friend reached out to her. Her friend sent her a quote from the Anglican mystic Julian of Norwich. It read, all shall be well, all shall be well, all manner of things shall be well. When the prophet Isaiah says, there is joy in the wilderness. We may wonder, how can this be? The land is dry. It is a desert. It is fruitless. Nothing is growing. No flowers are blooming. There is only bright sunshine, hot sand, and cold nights. And yet, he says, there shall be joy, because water will come and flowers will bloom in abundance. Streams will break forth in the desert. Waters will form pools and then swamps where reeds and rushes will grow. Then we see that the prophet is speaking metaphorically about the wilderness. He writes, The eyes of the blind shall be opened and the ears of the deaf unstopped, and then the lame shall leap like a deer and the tongues of the speechless sing for joy. He continues adding, a highway 
shall be in the wilderness, a holy highway that the people shall travel back to Zion. The prophet Isaiah writes during a period of history when the Israelites were in captivity in Babylon. He writes of a future when those taken away from their homeland will return. They will have endured the tests, have passed through stormy waters and dangerous shoals, and they will have emerged on the other side of their physical torments and pain to a place of joy. The question, however, remains, how can the prophet be so certain of the outcome? The student sitting on my couch could point to the older students in the dorm, knowing that they have endured the difficulties of of the exam days, so could he. The captain of the rescue vessel trusted his knowledge of the water and the bar built upon his daily navigation of the tricky tides and currents. He knew the waters around Chatham so well that he could cut through them with his eyes closed. The friend could send the the woman Julian's assuring words because every day people have life-saving surgeries and fully recover. The prophet, however, has no such knowledge to draw on. Isaiah does not know that all will be well. The people are in captivity as they have been for generations. All he has is a promise. A commitment from God. Here's why he has assurance. The pledge is not a future one. If you would look at the scriptures with me in your bulletin on page four. On the the right hand side, it reads, strengthen the weak hands and make firm the feeble knees. There are over 20 mentions of the word shall in this reading this morning but not here. Say to those who are of a fearful heart, be strong, do not fear. Why? Why does he say that? How can he make such a promise, such a statement of faith? He can because God is not coming in the future. God is not coming to make the wilderness rejoice with joy in singing. God is not coming to make a holy way. No, Isaiah says in the next line, here is your God. God is present now, even in captivity. God is with them today, even though they are not free. God is with them in their tests and in their pain, in their storms and their fears. God is with them in their wilderness. God is in the dry land and the desert. The story of Advent is not simply one of a future promise. It is not a pledge that someday God will remember you. It is not a reminder that God guarantees that one day, someday, God will be back. Nor is the story of Advent a historical one. It is not a pleasant fable where a baby is born. It is not meant just to be nice and sweet. Advent is not about saccharine feel-good moments that hold off the darkness pain and suffering in the world. No, the story of Advent is that God is here today, now, tomorrow, and always. The story Christians speak is different than that of the culture with its TV shows like the great Christmas light fight show. 
It is different, much different than that, that odd character, the elf on the shelf. It is less and more. Advent is a statement to the world that God is so great that he can come to earth in a baby born of a young mother in a corner of a very scary world. And it is a God small enough to say to each of us that we are not forgotten. Why? Because he has never left. There is joy in the wilderness. The desert shall rejoice and the dry lands shall be glad. All of creation knows this because our God is here.